love food, love cooking. This series will show how everyone can cook really lovely food at home and also introduce to you some new and exciting ingredients. I'm Simon Hopkinson <laughs> and from childhood onwards, eating good food has always been an adventure. I love cooking. It's my life. It's my passion. I opened my first restaurant age 20 and have been in and out of kitchens ever since. But now I'm better known for writing about food. For me, nothing beats cooking at home. It is my real inspiration, and I want to share my love of it with you. That is just how it should be. Tonight, I'm going to cook five favourites that I'm really fond of. Follow my recipes and make them work in your own kitchen. Lovely homemade food that will delight your friends. And if you take my advice, eating at home will always be a treat. I just love it. I never see cooking as a chore. In fact, time spent in the kitchen can be a real pleasure, relaxing even. I'm cooking rice today. This particular dish, this risotto, is one of the most simplest, the most pure, you could almost call it the naked risotto. A few simple ingredients treated with care can produce a masterful dish worthy of a professional kitchen. First of all, we need to get some stock hot. And this is a pale chicken stock. If, if you're vegetarian, of course, you could use a vegetable stock. If you don't have any homemade stock to hand, a good quality cube dissolved in boiling water will be just fine. For this risotto, buy the best butter. The more salty a butter, the more golden it is. So you can see that's incredibly pale and it will give you a lovely white finish to the dish. Chop the onions as finely as you can. When you're chopping onion, always keep your fingers rather more like this rather than like that. That's when you'll chop them off. These want to cook gently and slowly. Please don't rush them because me being the pedant that I am, I don't uh, want any scorched bits of onion in my perfectly pristine risotto. Because as with everything I cook, I want it to be as good as it possibly can be. Personally, I like to add the wine or vermouth to the buttery onions before the rice, which is not the usual method. I'm sure I'll be shouted at by a lot of people, but I find that if you add it to the rice, you have a, a raw taste in the rice, which just never goes away. That's a little quirk of mine. I'm, I, I'm just not mad about the raw alcohol taste. I like it if I'm drinking it, but not when I'm cooking with it. When the alcohol has almost evaporated, add the rice. And it goes straight away. Most supermarkets stock rice for risotto, and 200 grams here should amply feed a hungry couple. Keep the heat on low while we get those grains of rice coated with the butter. So we're going to add our first ladle stock, which will make a bit of a hiss. Making a risotto takes time. Only add stock to the rice once the previous addition has been absorbed. Energetic stirring is vital, releasing the rice from the starch, making it famously creamy. The secret of good risotto making is to agitate the rice a lot while you're cooking it. Faster stirring is much more preferable to gentle sort of stirring. It, it doesn't want that. You need to give it a bit of attitude. The rice I'm using is carnaroli, grown on the plains of northern Italy. The sleepy village of Desana is home to some of the finest varieties of rice. Every autumn, millions of tons of rice are harvested and the village springs to life. The rice is dried over a period of 48 hours. Despite the enormous scale, there remains a personal touch. Hand-picked samples are scrupulously tested for humidity. Grains must be absolutely moisture-free. Once dry, the rice needs to be cleaned. There are many varieties of rice, 
getting the right one for the job is essential. Arborea rice is the most common for making risotto, but Carnaroli is my preferred rice here because it produces plenty of starch, essential for making this risotto unctuous and velvety. You get into a nice rhythm stirring risotto. It, it becomes, well for me, it becomes a sort of movement. <laughs> My tummy starts jiggling about, and uh, that's part of my little risotto dance. <laughs> so the last bit of stock. Risotto isn't a garnish, and this is used so often these days where it's poured into one of these little metal moulds. Every risotto is held in place, it ain't a risotto. Off the heat. Rest for three minutes, then add extra butter and some parmesan cheese. To achieve the traditional fine texture, whiz it in a small food processor. You can keep it fresh and handy in the freezer. And I put in a little bit of uh, pepper now, white pepper, because it's a white dish, but I like the flavour too. This is called the manticari, which translates loosely as um, a lot of beating about with butter and cheese. <laughs> What all Italian waiters do, when they put it on the table, they do that. To get this lovely circle. And always a little extra parmesan. It is a beautiful plate of food. It's a dish of creamy rice, sharp parmesan, a plain white plate, and anything else would just get in the way. Always done good. Cooked with patience, care, and practice, a risotto is a pleasure to make. Clever old rice, butter, and cheese. I love shopping for food, always have done, particularly at my local market. I love places like this. I love the variety, I love the smells. It's an emporium. There's all sorts in a shop like this, from, from the sort of uh, most basic to the most exotic. Tens and tens and tens of coconut milk. Huge bags of rice. Dried chili flakes. Wonderful. It is like being a kid in a sweet shop. This sauce is so hot. I actually almost, I can't do that. I have a jar in the back of my fridge which just sits there. I occasionally get a bit brave and have some. This is weird stuff. This is called, um, I think it's asafoetida. Is it asafoetida? No, it's just yellow powder, it's called. What I really come in for is this. This fantastic red spice mix for my tandoori chicken drumsticks. Don't even think about a takeaway. You're going to love making this at home. Homemade, this dish is succulent and juicy. Cooked on a barbecue, it is extra special and smoky but can be just as easily cooked indoors. First of all, we're going to prepare these. You want the flesh to shrink. And to do that, just get a knife, heavy knife like this, and just push it through. So when they're cooked, you'll have a nice little handle to hold on to while you chew away. Removing the skin allows the chicken to blister as it cooks. I don't, I don't think I've ever met anybody who doesn't like tandoori chicken. Well, I have some vegetarian friends who wouldn't like tandoori chicken, but in general, it is a much loved import. The traditional cuts in the drumstick assure that the yogurt and spice will permeate the flesh, also tenderizing it. The tandoor, the clay oven, in which these are baked on a long skewer, very quickly because it's, you know, like the best pizza oven, it's very, very hot in there. So we have to try and replicate that. A very hot grill will do the job at home very successfully. Add salt and also lemon juice to sharpen the marinade. Use the most common and inexpensive plain yoghurt. It needs to be very runny, very ordinary yoghurt. So we have the tandoori spice mix. I like it, it's got to be red. This is very nice doing this. It reminds me of powder paint, school. 
Now for the mess. Just tip it into the chicken. I should be putting an apron on for this, but just stand back. For me, the chicken needs at least 24 hours in the tandoori marinade to make it taste really good and spicy. Another day wouldn't harm either. The fiery red drumsticks are ready, so under the grill they go. Uh, I've already preheated the grill, so um, in here it's hot and ready. They will only need about 30 minutes, and do make sure that the grill is as hot as can be. So while the chicken is um, grilling and cooking away there, I'm going to make a little dip, and it gives a nice cooling effect on the hot chicken. Simply, this is yoghurt, salt and sugar, together with some aromatic chopped mint. Oh, better check on me chicken. Oh, it's coming on nicely. To ensure that the drumsticks emerge trademark tandoori red, with blackened bits here and there, turn them regularly so they burnish evenly. The dip tastes even better with some fresh green chilli. Always test by rubbing your finger. That's actually, that's quite a hot one. So I'm not going to leave any seeds in here. Huh. And uh, let's give it a whiz. I think that's all right, actually. It looks just like my local Indian. So, um, spot on. <coughs> Good. Uh, we've got black bits. If you, if you are very familiar with tandoori chicken, you'll know that that looks pretty close to the real thing. Burn in this, in this dish is quite good. In fact, I, it's essential to have bits that burn. It's unusual to say that, but it's really true. I can honestly say I'm very happy with those, and um, I'm gonna eat one straight off the grill, if that's all right. Hot chicken, cool sauce. Very hot chicken. Hot and hot. I could eat these until the cows come home. They're very, very Moorish. Tandoori drumsticks are just dandy as party food, or for a summer supper eaten outside. So easy to make. Certain Italian ingredients make me very excited indeed. In fact, some of my favourite dishes are inspired by these wonderful products. And one of these is truly special, Parma ham. Not surprisingly, Parma ham comes from the city of Parma in northern Italy. The two-year curing process begins with the highly trained maestro Salitori, or salt master, who rubs sea salt into the pork leg. After one year, the ham is smeared with a mixture called surino, seasoned lard mixed with a touch of ground rice. This coating protects the exposed meat from the elements. The ham is tested for quality and given a trademark seal of approval. It is now perfect and with its unique flavour and texture guaranteed. Parma ham is essential to one of my best beloved dishes. I also have an excuse to make pancakes, and less difficult to make than you might think. Start the pancake mix with two eggs. Always whisk with vigour as you add the flour to avoid lumps. You want to get the flour into the eggs to ensure a smooth batter. Add a pinch of salt, some milk, 50 grams of melted butter and the rest of the milk. Whisking until you achieve a pouring cream consistency. Batter made. Leave the mixture to rest for 30 minutes. 
Now to my lovely asparagus. I'm allowing two spears for each pancake. I peel them because it's part of my chefy upbringing and I just can't help it. Boil for a few minutes. They are tender when they can be easily pierced with a sharp knife. Plunge them into ice cold water. This shock treatment keeps that lovely vibrant green colour. Right, pop them on here. And now we're going to make the hollandaise sauce. Homemade hollandaise is a beautiful thing. The more you practice, the easier it gets. Begin with three egg yolks. Whisk the yolks over a pan of simmering water on a very low heat. Anything too hot will cook the egg yolks too quickly. We want to get these thickened and mousse-like. Now add the melted butter, whisking all the time. Very buttery, ever so healthy. Add a little lemon juice to taste and a touch of salt. I think we're there. Lovely. And the hollandaise is ready. Back to the pancake mix, which is now ready to go. For the first pancake, grease the pan with a tiny amount of butter. It is a knack. My mum used to make them quite a lot for my brother and I. Just lemon juice and sugar, which is, for me, still the best way to have a sweet pancake. Just pour one in. The first pancake always goes in the bin. We're just seasoning the pan. Batter getting to know the pan. And then we're on our way. That done, all future pancakes should be perfect. Just bang it out. Right. Place the parma ham and asparagus in the pancakes, roll up and put in a baking tray. Cook in the oven for about 20 minutes at 180 until they begin to crisp at the edges. Coat each one with a spoonful of hollandaise sauce. Then briefly flash the pancakes under a hot grill until they are only just golden. There we have them. Delicious delis. It is, it's a dead elegant little dish. It is made by that delicious parma ham. It gives it that lovely savoury note. Quite clever. One pancake makes a wonderful starter. Two or three would make a delicious lunch. A classic quiche Lorraine is a beautiful thing. Over the years, its reputation has been tarnished by careless cooking. I'm going to show you how to make it properly. This quiche will banish bad memories of the wedding buffet. A French classic, it can be truly special, and mine is the real McCoy. We called it quiche at home when I was a little boy because we didn't know any different. And um, in fact, it was generally known as bacon egg pie. This is going to be a very nice quiche. So, I'll put the machine straight on the scales. We're going to need 60 grams of butter and 60 grams of lard. And then add 200 grams of flour. Whiz all the ingredients together in a food processor. Have a quick look. I don't want it so fine that it's like sand. I just like just a few tiny lumps of fat. Add two to three tablespoons of ice cold water to bind it together. I am quite old-fashioned in that my mum always did. I use a knife. Stir with a knife, stir with strife. Lightly knead the dough. And dust with flour. This looks fine. Good pastry making needs care and attention. Put the pastry into a plastic bag and leave it in the fridge for 30 minutes. And one very important thing I'm going to do now before I forget is to put a flat baking sheet in the oven. Nice solid one. This, this heated up will help to cook the bottom of the pastry case um, when it's baking blind and will give a nice crisp bottom to the, to the tart. 
set the oven to 180 or gas mark 4. Now it's time to make the filling. Lightly fry the smoked streaky bacon. Take the chilled dough from the fridge and roll out as thinly as possible. I love making and rolling out homemade pastry. I know most pastry can be bought ready rolled, but I'm a traditionalist at heart. It's a very well behaved pastry, by the way. It's not too difficult to roll. I'd say it's, it's untemperamental. Place the pastry in a well greased tart tin. Make sure you push the pastry right into the corner. Try not to have too many, what I call little sort of folds. So now just go straight over with the rolling pin. Pull that off. Now make a few pricks with a fork into the base of the pastry. Don't worry, these will close up against once they're cooked. It just prevents the pastry from rising too much. Okay, that feels good. So we're going to blind bake this pastry, which in effect means pre-cooking. Butter some tin foil and place grease side down onto the pastry. Then weight it down with either some lentils, chickpeas, or any dried bean. And that's ready to go into the oven. Place on a flat baking tray and cook for about 15 minutes. Now remove the lentils and foil. And cook for a further 10 minutes. Back in. While the pastry is becoming nice and crisp, I'll begin the filling. So we've got three eggs and we're going to have four yolks. Whisk lightly and add pepper. Plenty of pepper. I like quite a peppery quiche, white pepper. Then add whipping cream. And grate in a third of a whole nutmeg. Good. That's perfect. The pastry should now be pale golden and cooked through. I'm going to pop the bacon in the bottom. Just distribute it around. And back into the oven. Oh, this is very nice. Very nice puffed up quiche. Quiche should never be eaten piping hot straight from the oven. It tastes much better warm or even at room temperature. Hot quiche has little flavour. Wobble, wobble. Lovely. Gently does it. Ooh, wobble, wobble. I don't think you ever need a knife with a quiche. It's, quiche is to be forked. It's a voluptuous thing, this. It's bliss. It's really bliss. Very happy. I can see this quiche Lorraine becoming a lovely family favourite. Made this way, it is in a different class to those dried out quiches of old. These days, I've become a bit of an early bird. Every morning, I like a walk by the river before breakfast. Even at this early hour, I think about cooking, and a cup of coffee gets me going. Coffee can be a great flavour to play with, and obviously for something sweet. Believe it or not, I'm going to make something that has only two ingredients, coffee and sugar. And the only other two things you need to make it is a freezer and a fork. These frozen coffee crystals, similar to a sorbet, but with attitude, are astonishingly easy to make. Your friends will ask, how did you make that? Now, I'm going to fill this with water. The coffee itself in here is going to be full, so we get an almost double strength, like an espresso. If you don't have a coffee maker like mine, then just make very strong coffee in the way you normally would. And for the finest flavour, use the finest ground coffee. Now, if you're going to make something like this and take time over it, take time over your coffee. But I do like the cup of coffee. So, let that bubble away. 
and what we need is a metal tray. To make this coffee granita successfully, put a metal tray in the freezer to get really cold. Also, put serving bowls in the freezer too. Once the coffee is made, add the sugar until it dissolves. It just needs to be, you know, put finger in, need to take out quickly hot. That's fine. Pour the sweet coffee into the ice cold tray. So, into the freezer. Leave for about 40 minutes. It's now that the granita needs a little attention. About every half hour, take a fork and drag it through the mixture, moving the crystals that have formed into the liquid part. And that's done. Straight back into the freezer. You'll need to do this three or four times. It is the key to achieving the perfect melt in the mouth texture. This is perfect. You can see it's changed colour. It actually, you get quite a lot of servings from this. If you think, if you think back to how it was when it was liquid or even how to that last stage was, it's almost filling the dish now. Put it back in the freezer for the last time just to keep it while I whip some cream. I know I said two ingredients, but I can't resist adding whipped cream. Uh, vanilla pod, I'm just going to put a few seeds in, scrape those out. Then add some icing sugar. Not too much, it's just to add a touch of sweetness. When you beat cream, just from the agitation of doing it, warms up the cream. However cold it is, a little bit of crushed ice as you're whipping away, just keeps the temperature cool. Just take a few ice cubes and crush them in a tea towel before adding to the cream. This keeps the cream cold and adds lightness. We want to get it so that it's just dropping off the whisk. That's fine. Time to serve the granita. Wow. Really makes me smile, this. And it's, it's that that I really love. Coffee and cream, all melting. It's marvellous. This combination of ice-cold coffee and soft, rich cream is the classic Italian cafe treat. Perfetto. Next time, I'll be showing you five more super recipes, all of them special, all of them easily made in the comfort of your own kitchen. Restaurant quality, made by you.